Troll Hunters, Disc 7. Chapter 29 That evening, we began to win. The fragments of my life's failures, video games left unconquered, hobbies abandoned, sports left to guys much bigger, all perfectly interlocked to supply me with everything I needed as a troll hunter. My whole miserable life, rather than being a waste, felt like it had been training for this. None of my fellow warriors needed to comment upon the change in me. We all felt it, none more so than the gum-gums, whose softies we pierced and whose gallbladders we harvested for burning. Our first conquest that evening was with a quartet of worm-beards, hulking, bulbous creatures whose objectives were to whisper demoralizing insults to children while they slept so that the children would be compelled to run away from home, sad little sojourns that always ended while passing beneath a bridge. Wormbeards were so fat around the middle they could roll themselves at you like runaway boulders. They achieved impressive speeds that way, and I don't think I'll ever forget dashing down Jefferson Street with Jack, Blinky, and Arg at my heels, chasing a rolling gray blob as it bulldozed mailboxes and road signs and a single fire hydrant. I burst through the jetting water and threw Clareblade like a javelin. It sunk into the Wormbeard's spine and he unballed, denting two cars with his outstretched paws. The next morning, the damage would be blamed on a hit-and-run driver. Only we hunters knew the truth. We tried to intimidate the Wormbeards into revealing Gunmar's location. They used their dying breaths to laugh at us. Using Arg's nose and Jack's astrolabe, we raced from bridge to bridge trying to divine the secret opening to the gum-gum lair. Every door we took led us through sewer pipes and long-forgotten caverns, but sooner or later we'd find ourselves back in a bland St. B suburb under assault from another troll lowlife. Tuesday morning came fast enough to make me want to vomit. I plodded through hallways decked out in red and white crepe paper, and in gym class flat out refused to climb the rope because of my sore muscles. Tub didn't say a word in my defense, while Coach Lawrence wrote me a detention slip. I carried that worthless slip of paper all the way to play rehearsal, where I was unintelligible with exhaustion. Mrs. Leach had no choice but to call in Steve, and I was sure Claire preferred him anyway. With a mixture of relief and remorse, I sunk into an auditorium chair sedated by the knowledge that my skills were the kind that had to stay hidden. Just a few hours more, and I'd prove it. The Yarbloods were the smallest trolls in the known universe, complained about in everything from Sumerian pictographs to Egyptian hieroglyphs. These legendary nuisances were no larger than mosquitoes and fed upon children who played outside too late. The Yarbloods attached themselves to hair like lice and burrowed into a child's skull to cause illness. We followed Jack's astrolabe to their latest hunting ground, a local orphanage. Jack slathered a sour-smelling slime upon the upper lip of any kid we found within the grips of a fever. The slime made the kids need to defecate. We hid in the hallway while the first boy stumbled to the bathroom. Afterward, we ran in, and Jack commanded me to reach down into the toilet. I did it without question, until my arm was submerged in toilet water up to my shoulder. I felt it, some kind of clog, and wrestled with it for a minute before yanking out a lump of white, mice-sized trolls clinging to one another with claws and teeth. The Yarbloods had grown quite a bit before they'd been pooped out. Unpleasant to catch for sure, but pretty easy to kill. Sergeant Gulliger crawled by in his cruiser as we were leaving. By the dashboard light, I could make out his drawn face as he drained the latest in what was probably a long line of cups of coffee. After seeing Arg with his own eyes in the junkyard, 
no doubt he was questioning his sanity, and yet he had a community to protect. So he was up every night, just like me, doing what he thought was right. I thought about him as we troll hunters spent the next few hours burning gallbladders behind a vacant warehouse. Wednesday came as it always did, though I'd have been hard-pressed to tell you the day of the week if you'd asked. The only way I was keeping track of time was by the rising number of missing students in each class. Though I ignored Pinkton's math, I made calculations of my own, adding up the vacant desks. It was no different at play rehearsal. Where was our Mercutio? Our Friar John? Then, in a crash, it was night. Meet the Zun. Their dingy drawstring bags told you all you needed to know. They were out to nab kids for Gunmar, plain and simple. The Zun fought as a team, rushing at us with arms locked like rugby players and wearing matching jumpsuits dyed with red and green stripes and helmets constructed from the skulls of larger trolls. It was rather intimidating, truth be told, but their bash-and-smash technique was no equal to four well-wielded swords, a few dozen whipping tendrils, and a member of the Arg family fortified by a three-course meal of cats. Even as they were losing, the Zun belted out their minor key fight song. To counter, I began shouting bits of Shakespeare coming to me from out of nowhere. Take the measure of your unmade grave, fiend! Off went a pouch of softies. Alack, there lies more peril in mine eye than twenty of thine swords. Off went a pair of hands. Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. Off went a head, still wearing its helmet. Never had a troll hunter slayed with such style. Even my companions were stunned. Soon the squad of Zun was no more and we spent the rest of the night on another fruitless search for the gum-gums. More than once we had to hide to avoid the zealous eyes of Sergeant Gulliger. He was everywhere, all of the time, and I was duly impressed. He wanted to help, that was obvious, but even heroes had their limits. This fight was not for him. Chapter 30 When we got home, I didn't think much of the light and sound coming from the TV. I packed Jack's lunch, as I did each morning before grabbing a couple of hours of sleep, but when I found him, he was glued to the television. At first I couldn't make sense of the wobbly low-resolution footage, but then I recognized trolls, and not just any trolls. The footage stabilized and I saw Blinky and Arg standing in what looked like a kitchen, their faces smeared with peanut butter. The next thing I heard was human voices. My voice. Tub's voice. I went light-headed and gripped for something to keep me standing. Nothing was there and I staggered, far enough to see the cables leading from the TV to a teddy bear the nanny cam that I had forgotten about. Dad sat on the sofa, watching it in a stupor that suggested he'd been watching for hours. Jack didn't need to say a word. He'd forgotten to apply the schmoof. The packed lunch fell from my hand with a paper bag crinkle. The noise broke through Dad's trance, and with aching slowness he reached for the teddy bear. The grainy footage blinked off and was replaced by early show video of a sunken-eyed Sergeant Gulliger refusing to confirm that more than four kids had disappeared. Individuals cannot be considered missing until they have been gone for twenty-four hours, he said. In light of these disappearances, asked the reporter, should the Festival of the Fallen Leaves be cancelled for the first time in San Bernardino history? Of course not, Gulliger said without emotion. There is no reason for panic. Dad modulated his breathing before turning our way. 
We must band together as a community, Gulliger said from the TV. Dad stood. The sofa springs creaked. He was much taller than Jack. We must show unity in the face of strife, Gulliger insisted. Dad took a single step. His eyes swam with tears of confusion. Beside me, Jack was nailed to the floor. Jack? Dad whispered. Is it really you? Jimbo, Jack said. There was a pause, filled with the babble of a commercial break. I'm sorry, both brothers said together. Dad reached out to Jack, but his hand floated upward of its own accord. His eyes followed his hand, and his neck began to roll backward. Then, with the first lancets of morning light poking through the chinks of the steel shutters and jabbing the counter on which was propped a framed milk carton photo of the brother lost forty-five years earlier, my dad, Jim Sturgis Sr., originator of the Band-Aid method of glasses repair and uncredited inventor of the Excalibur calculator pocket, fainted. Chapter 31 88% Pinkton had drilled the number into me for weeks. The math test was the next day, and that was the grade I needed. But all I could do was apply the merciless percentage to other events in my life. 88% chance that I would not be playing Romeo. 88% chance that Tubb would never speak to me again. 88% chance that Gunmar the Black would return. 88% chance that I would die upon the field of troll battle. 88% chance that Dad had lost what was left of his mind. I'd left Dad and Jack in the living room. Dad's unconscious body had been transported to the sofa before I threw myself in the shower for a quick rinse. By the time I emerged with a fresh set of clothes, Dad was awake but hunched on the edge of the sofa, facing away from Jack and whispering to himself that he was being tricked. Someone was trying to trick him. Jack, looking young and innocent in my baggy hand-me-downs, gave me a distraught look. Would Dad call Sergeant Gulliger? Principal Cole? Would he find some way to prevent me from troll hunting just a single day's time before the Killaheed's completion? Jack wanted me to blow off school and help him with this brother situation. It was well outside of his comfort zone of hunting and killing. But I found the reunion of long-lost siblings too intense, too personal. At least at school I could lose myself in the Steve-smacking clamor of kids with nothing on their minds beyond the game the next night. I grabbed my backpack and didn't look back until I'd caught the bus. With Pinkton's 88% ringing in my ears, I made a pit stop at my locker for my math book. I found myself longing to trash compact myself just so I could take advantage of the privacy for a nap. It was while I weighed the pros and cons of this plan that I heard a cruel laughter down the hall. It wasn't enough to convince me to move. Even the smacking of a basketball failed to incite my interest. What did it were the snatches of words in that cool, finely articulated voice. Ten dollars is the new price, I heard. Inflation. Just down the hall... Tubb's head was wrenched beneath the arm of Steve Jorgensen Warner. It was a reprise of the scene in the trophy cave, but with the fun-added bonus of a fair increase that Tubb would never be able to satisfy with his grandma's pitiful allowance. I was heading toward them before I knew what I was doing, pushing aside rubberneckers. I wasn't the same guy that I had been a week before, not even close. With both hands, I shoved Steve in the chest. Until that moment, 
I'd never realized the extent of his muscle density. He didn't budge an inch. But the action garnered the desired effect. He pitched Tub to the side to regard this newer, more interesting victim. A cymbal clash announced Tub's head-on collision with a locker, but I kept my eyes trained on the enemy and his bouncing ball. Smack! Smack! Jim, thanks for reminding me, Steve said. I've been meaning to ask if you'd be willing to participate in our daily toll. It's a great program with lots of keen benefits. Lay off, Tub. Smack, smack. I'll take that as a yes. Why don't we start right away? Lay off everyone. Everyone's sick of your crap. Smack, smack. Are they? I hadn't noticed. Seemed to me it was the opposite. They're just scared of you. I'm not. Smack, smack. Scared? Why should anyone be scared? I'm the guy who's going to score the winning touchdown tomorrow. I'm the guy who's going to do a quick costume change and perform some play in the middle of the field. All night, it's going to be me up there on the Jumbotron. I don't do it for personal glory, Jim. I do it for the school. People appreciate that. They're only too happy to give a few bucks here and there for the cause. Smack, smack. That's my role, I growled. You did look cute in your skirt and tights, I'll give you that. Tough break. Don't worry, I'll be sure to give your Juliet a big, wet kiss from the both of us. Why are you so interested in Claire all of a sudden? Why? Steve repeated. Why not? He laughed. In comparison, I realized that my voice had become wheedling. The dull weight that had heavied my fists seconds before was gone. Weakness snowballed. Onlookers were chuckling, and it hurt like it used to. I hung my head and turned to find my books where I'd tossed them aside. My only successes came in the dark of night. I should have known better than to try to take on Steve in the light of day. You're a dober, Mr. Jorgensen Warner! All heads, including mine, turned toward an accented voice that sounded considerably less adorable when it was crackling with fury. Claire had dodged through the crowd and stood there in her familiar greys and greens, her beret tipped at a wartime angle. The only things pink about her this time were her cheeks inflamed with rage. Steve's laugh was uncertain. I'm a what? Claire came within striking range. I'd soon as kiss a chanter like you as I'd shag a goat in a rot outhouse. Shag a... You try and give me a nookie badge and you'll find yourself with a keeker, you daft muppet. Jim is twice your Romeo. Say otherwise and I'll play fisticuffs with your hooter and kick you in your ball bag. You'll play what? With my hooter? Look at you. You right glyphed, you bass. What, you think I'm a queen? More like a radge. I'll dance the slosh on your napper and do a number on both your wallies and your walloper. Then you'll be crying to your ma, you will. Wallies? Walloper? Pent-up slang from her homeland, long boxed up, came pouring out in a stream as incredible as it was indecipherable. You could intuit some meaning, kicking him in assorted sensitive areas seemed to be the basic gist, but mostly it was violent emotion delivered by a girl whose easygoing attitude had always been her most notable trait. She was right up in Steve's face when she lashed out with a foot and kicked the basketball all the way down the hall. His eyes went wide, and his right hand formed into a fist. We all saw it. Claire pointed at it. Her bravado knew no bounds, and laughed as if it were a child's pinwheel. Oh, your ma cares, you shite-tongued zoomer. 
best remember my way with the sword before you go waving your puny knuckle pouch. Chiding laughter, so fickle in high school hallways, now tottered in Steve's direction. He'd never been the target of ridicule and was baffled. He looked at each chuckling face as if it were a personal betrayal. His handsomeness separated into ugly pieces of panic, beady eyes narrowed to stony glints, sharp teeth bared in a defensive sneer, and his thick body compacted as if bracing for a tackle. Then he made the wisest choice he could. He sucked down his anger and turned tail. He might rule again, but that day was lost. He took off after his basketball and looked pretty childish while doing it. The rubberneckers dispersed, repeating snippets of Claire's tirade guaranteed to be incorporated into local vernacular. I let out a giant held breath and turned to help up Tub. There was a dent in the closest locker, but he was gone. I was disappointed though I couldn't blame a guy for wanting to flee a monster. I was familiar with the instinct. Claire, though, was there, and when the bell rang, she wasn't startled. She gave me a level consideration. Mr. Sturgis, she said. Ms. Fontaine? I tried. She nodded sagely as if judging my response adequate. You seem a bit different, Mr. Sturgis. So do you, I said. Oh, that? She rolled her eyes. You should hear me when I bump my knee. I'll never bump your knee, that's a promise. I heard Miss Pinkton today about your troubles. About the eighty, eighty-eight percent, I finished. Yeah. I'm not half bad at numbers, Mr. Sturgis. I know, it's very impressive. She rolled her eyes again. I mean, I can help you, you scaffy skanker. No, please. I held up a hand. None of those words. I can't take it. Her smile was glorious, and her laugh as loud as ever. Let's meet tonight. Eighty-eight is nothing. I can get you to ninety. You... you want me to come over? Her smile faltered. I'm sorry, you misunderstood. You can't come over. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, great. Thanks. Relax, Mr. Sturgis, it's not you. My house just isn't a good place to visit, in general. But I could come over to your place. I've told Mum that tonight is the final rehearsal, and I know she can convince Dad that it's going to be a late one. You and I can walk together after the final run-through, set up at your house, and get right to the numbers. I know a few tricks that'll kablooey your brain. I'm... The concept of turning down any offer from Claire Fontaine was a difficult one. But the truth was the truth. I needed sleep even if it was just two or three hours, because when the sun went down, the final hunt was on. We had only one night to find the gum-gums before the Killaheed reached its completion. I sighed and continued. I'm not coming to rehearsal. Her disappointment was evident. I appreciated it. If I was bailing on Roju that night, there was no hope of my salvaging the role. She'd have to act opposite Steve, the guy she just humiliated in front of the entire school. For a moment, I wondered if she might walk away from the whole deal. But then her expression sharpened. That's the kind of girl she was. She'd decided to relish acting opposite Steve. It was a challenge, and if she delivered her lines just right, Maybe she could show him who was boss more than once. All righty, she said. Six o'clock, Sturgis household. What do you say? The simple question was riddled with risk. 
Nobody but Tub had ever visited the steel-plated, camera-protected stronghold of my home. An eight-eyed creature was hiding in my bedroom closet. My dad was on the precipice of total breakdown upon the arrival of a supposedly dead older brother who'd not aged a single day. And once it was dark enough, a band of sword-wielding weirdos would come together in my living room to track down the infamous villain who'd taken at least a dozen kids in the past week, who knew my name and wanted me as well. There were a million reasons to say no to Claire except one. I'd been waiting all my life to say yes. Chapter 32 Claire Fontaine knocked at my door twenty minutes late, rosy-cheeked and complaining about all the festival rubbish that was making the whole town look like a little kid's birthday party. I went, <laughs> a laugh so forced that I creeped myself out. Thankfully, she came inside anyway. I closed the door behind her and reached for the first of the ten locks, ready to whip through the repertoire of click, rattle, zing, rattle, clack, 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 thunk, crunch, whisk, rattle, rattle, thud, before stopping myself. Not with her watching, I wouldn't. I was braver than that now. I left the door unlocked. Claire missed nothing. Within seconds, she'd zeroed in on the metal shutters, the three security consoles, and the dangling wires of the kitchen ceiling fan, which still hadn't been replaced. She asked after Dad, and I had to plead ignorance. He was gone, and this was not normal. Dad spent no more time at San Bernardino Electronics than was required. Again, I offered my, <laughs> and again, she overlooked it. She bounded through the kitchen and flung her pink backpack upon the dining room table, and moments later, we were pulling out textbooks and strategically arranging pencils and paper. The first hour was useless. I kept smelling her and feeling the heat from her body and repeating in my head that I had a girl at my house. Not just a girl, but THE girl. So it came as a surprise when numbers, correct ones, started imprinting themselves on paper as if my pencil were possessed. After another hour of Claire's arithmetical trickery, Insight was slashing through my brain as swiftly as the first blades of morning light through Troll City. Maybe I'd surprise Pinkton after all. Your dad's going to be upset. Is that it? My face was so close to the page I could smell the pencil lead. I looked up into a bag of chips, which Claire pushed aside so she could see me. What do you mean? I asked. You've been checking the front door all night. Have I? Like you're expecting him to come busting in with a tire iron and bash in our heads. Sorry, I said. He wouldn't use a tire iron. Her eyes widened. Oh? What would he use, then? A cricket bat? No, no, no. He's not going to use anything, period. He's not going to attack us. I can't believe we're having this conversation. Dad works in electronics. He mows lawns. No one's getting their head bashed in. I'm just... It's weird, because he normally doesn't work late. He'll probably just be surprised to see you when he gets here, that's all. Because I don't, you know, have a lot of people over. Yes, I noticed the defenses. Terrifically imposing. Are we expecting an invasion? I shrugged. There's always something. That's what Dad would say. Is there? Always something, I mean. Is America all that dangerous? Depends on where you go. I pictured the space beneath my bed. There are bad areas. This street didn't look like a bad area, unless the gang members here wear sweater vests. It's not a bad area. Dad's just excitable. And how does your mum feel about this? Most women I know aren't in love with the steel shutters and barred windows look. To each her own, of course. 
Yeah, she didn't like it either. She's gone? Yeah. Dead? The frankness with which she asked this caught me off guard. I dared to look at her for several consecutive seconds and detected nothing besides an earnest desire to know. Her lack of shyness inspired me to behave likewise. She left us when I was a kid. Why did she do that? Nice boy like you, husband who wouldn't use a tire iron on anyone. I grinned. It was just... this. I gestured at the barricades. That's my theory, anyway. She and Dad were having some issues, I was old enough to know that, but I never knew it was that bad. One day she was here and things were pretty normal, and the next day she left. You don't hear from her? Nope. After she left, my dad said a few things, not a whole lot, but I got the impression she had a strange past, you know? Like she was maybe in jail or something? I'd believe it. She was smart, but kind of devious, too. She probably married Dad because he was safe, different than the rest of her life. But she can take care of herself. I bet she went and got herself a new name and a new ID and is off getting sick of a whole new husband and little kid. Mexico, maybe, or Hawaii, or just some small tropical island somewhere. That's sweet of you. What's sweet of me? To imagine her somewhere beautiful like that. This made me stop and think. I did, in fact, picture my mom walking barefoot along a beachfront, dodging sand dollars and starfish, inhaling the salt smell and trying to find glimpses of her old life in the red sun setting behind a lush green mountain. These fantasies were dry of emotion, and for the first time, I wondered if I had drained them to protect myself. I was home, sick, the day she left, I said. I was there when she walked out. She didn't say a thing. She just undid all the locks and walked out. After a while, I got up and locked the door behind her. I was just a kid. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. So I don't feel sweet, you know? I locked the door behind her. It was the day before my birthday, the first of May, and I was like, well, if she's not going to at least stay for my birthday, then screw her. May 2nd is my birthday, too, Claire said. Seriously? Inverness, Scotland, May 2nd. Scotland? I thought you were from, like, London. London? Good God! Don't you know a Scottish accent when you hear one? Well, they're similar, right? Similar? You say that in the Highlands, mister, and you'll be spouting a bleeder. Sorry, I didn't... I guess I don't know my accents as well as, hey, we ought to have a party together in May. A party? Two seconds ago you were going to punch me. Though I'm a full year older than you, my guests might be a little more mature. At least you'd have guests. What about Tobias? He's worth three or four guests, I'd wager. Tub and I aren't really talking at the moment. Mr. Sturgis, she sighed. So much gloom. I set down my pencil atop my math and turned to her. I honestly don't see how you do it. I've been here all my life, and I'm like a disease. You've been at our school for like two minutes, and you've got friends falling out of your ears. You yell at cool kids in the hall, and you're a hero instead of getting stomped? You've got two parents who sign you up for cool things like fencing lessons? It blows my mind. What is that like? Seriously, what in the world is that like? To have a life so... nice... Claire had been twisting a lock of deviant hair around a finger. She let it go and it sprung back to her cheek like the stay sail of a boat after being severed. Her expression was not one of offense or anger, but rather of darkened curiosity, as if weighing whether I was prepared for a truthful response. I judged that I wasn't, 
but it was too late. She removed her beret and shook out her hair, which leapt in all directions, a regiment of serpents to back her up. Then she lifted that pink backpack from the chair, set it upon the table, unzipped it, and withdrew the last things I'd expected to see. Clothes, pretty ones, the kind of ensemble that would vault a girl like her into the popular crowd the instant she walked through school doors. A svelte pink dress with teal trim and matching hair ribbon. A pair of heeled shoes, two sparkly earrings, a tangled strand of pearls. And loads of cosmetics. Eyeshadow, lipstick, blush, nail polish, and several other containers I wasn't qualified to identify. The last item she removed was a well-used jar of makeup remover. She held this for a moment longer, as if it carried the most significance. We do have a nice life, she spoke carefully. We have a nice house. Mum keeps it nice because that's how Da likes it. We have nice hobbies. It's not just fencing lessons I've been instructed to take. It's piano voice, all the best diversions for some Scots out to be an upstanding American family. We have nice food, turkey, potatoes, greens. Da likes us to have nice food. He makes sure that's understood. And we dress very nicely, very nicely indeed. I'd say if you were to stop by our place and peek in our window around dinner time, you might nominate us for the nicest family in all of San Bernardino. Perfect for postcards and TV sitcoms. All we're missing are the spunky little dog and wacky neighbor. The pink backpack sat between us on the table like an engorged insect on a dissection slab, cut open and spilling its ugly secrets. Monsters don't always look like monsters, she said. Who knew this better than me? Blinky and Arg had been walking nightmares just days before, and now were my most trusted friends. Meanwhile, other beings who looked perfectly normal moved through life in simulated benevolence. The Steve Jorgensen Warners of the world, the Professor Lempkas, the Null Huller changelings that, according to Blinky, ran most of Washington. Perhaps Mr. or Mrs. Fontaine fit into the same category, demanding a personality from their daughter that she'd been forced to invent. I'm sorry, I said. Don't be. You didn't say it out of meanness. You said it because you think of me living in a make-believe place as wonderful as that of your mum, even though neither of us deserves it. You're a good person, Mr. Sturgis. A bit gloomy, but good. Okay, I said. I like it when you say it anyway. If I am lucky, I will live to be an old man, and when I am lying there on my last pillow with bleeping electronic equipment hooked up to measure the exact distance to my death, there will be a few choice memories that run on repeat in my brain because I won't want to leave life with any other thoughts but the sweetest. What happened next will be one of those memories. Claire Fontaine, the sort of girl confident enough to one day take on the world and be the equal of those of the highest rank, thought enough of me in that moment to reach out with both hands and encircle my wrists. The raw ends of her electrical wire bracelets poked into my skin. The adamant tips of her fingers crawled up my forearms and then pulled me closer. Her hair, as wild as ever, touched me long before anything else, and I remember the spiderweb tickle of each follicle against my cheek. Then she was too close for me to keep in focus and she became the world's most beautiful blur. For all my fantasies, I'd never really thought about how soft lips feel when pressed against other lips. My phone made sure we didn't enjoy it for too long. 
Claire sat back with an eyebrow raised as if judging my performance as unconventional but precocious, and I blinked at her for a few seconds before rustling through the pocket of my coat for the stupid ringing piece of junk that so badly needed to be destroyed. My stomach lurched a bit. It was Dad, so I held up a wait-a-second finger to Claire, stood up, and answered the phone while heading into the dim light of the kitchen. You okay? I asked. He sounded depleted. I can't answer that, Jimmy. But I'll be home later. I didn't want you to worry. There's some meals in the freezer you can heat up. I think there's a cheesy garlic lasagna, maybe a broccoli and beef. You like those. Go ahead and eat. It's just been a challenging day, and there's still a few things I need to think about before I come home, and... I don't even know what happens then. Things are weird right now, I said. I know that, but we can deal with it. You haven't even met the others yet. All right, I admit that's going to be pretty weird too, but if we just all get in the same room, we can explain the whole thing to you, okay? Just as soon as the sun goes down. Sun's already down, Dad said. I'll be home eventually. Take care. The call went dead. For a moment, I was unsettled by his detachment, but that was replaced by the information he'd passed along. It was indeed dark out. I leaned over the kitchen sink and ducked beneath the steel shutters. The floodlights were flickering with moths, a sure sign that they'd been on for some time. The hours had slipped away. I laughed to myself. Math had never been so diverting. Claire screamed. It was a guttural noise, as if she were trying to break away from an unwanted embrace. Something wooden exploded, followed by the gonging of stricken metal. Then came the sound of running, way too many feet, followed by a horrible series of sounds. A musical snap like the tearing of guitar strings, the muffled ripping of several thick layers of fabric, and the splinter of lumber being chomped between teeth. Claire! I called. The name still reverberating from my kissed lips, I sprinted into the dining room, pausing only long enough to note each disaster. Claire gone with no trace but her beret, her chair rolling across the floor in a dozen pieces, a massive dent in the corner of the table where something huge had kneaded on its way out, and the white birds of our math problems making slow, doomed descents. Her pink backpack was missing. She'd managed to grab it, though what good it might do her was beyond me. In my bedroom, I blundered into a snowstorm of mattress guts. A mouth-like hole had been burrowed straight through the center of my bed. The mattress, the springs, everything. I leapt to the edge of the hole and saw the last few motions of the floorboards as the secret staircase locked itself away. Claire's screams echoed from below, caught in the phantom space of the hardwood floor, the concrete foundation, the clay, and on and on, deeper and deeper, world upon world, and fear upon fear. I threw myself into the cavity of the bed and drove my heels at the floor, shouting for it to open. The chewed-off edges of the box spring scratched at my upper body as I fell to my knees and dug at individual boards with my fingernails. I might be a troll hunter, but I had no idea how to open that door, and without such knowledge right that second, I was worse than worthless. My screams for Blinky hammered off the flat surfaces of my room. The troll slithered from the closet with the sound of a birth of snakes, his eight red eyes blinking away curds of sleep. I kept clawing at the floor as I felt tentacles, too many to push aside, wrapping around my torso and lifting me out of the cratered bed. Let me go! We have to save her! 
I wriggled in midair before my feet touched down amid drifts of mattress foam. Blinky's appendages had my body encircled from behind, and the more I fought to be set free, the tighter he squeezed. Slime oozed from between tentacles as he began to speak in a dapper, infuriating tone that I didn't want to hear, warning me that waiting beneath these boards was an ambush. He had written all about the strategy in Volume 12 of his dissertation. Though I didn't want to believe it, I heard them, and I felt them right through my feet, a seething swarm of gum-gums just beneath the floor, cackling and slurping in expectation of sinking their teeth into fresh teenager. Claire was gone to their unspeakable hands, taken to unimaginable places, and it was my fault. I moaned and reached for my swords to cut something, anything, just to relish in the breakage. Blinky's eight eyes lowered before me like wilting flowers and shone at such wattage that I had to shield myself from the brightness. Then the ancient troll inhaled, and I felt against my back the warm beats of multiple hearts and the inflation of at least four giant lungs. A sound rose from somewhere inside his guts. It began low, like the boom of a train crossing distant tracks, but then added the higher octave of whale shrieks and the shrill clanging of bicycle bells rang by boys outrunning the death of summer, the end of childhood, and all other manner of gluttonous beast. What it was was a call, one loud enough to be heard across the neighborhood, provided that you had the right kind of ears. My medallion began to burn, and I could smell the singed skin of my chest. Beyond the pain, though, the translation was forceful and clear, and it made me catch my breath. Troll hunters! Blinky held me and howled, and I howled too, sending a prayer out to Claire, to all of the missing. Hold tight! Part 4. The Battle of the Fallen Leaves Chapter 33 Jack banged through the unlocked front door, took one whiff of acrid air, and ran to my room, where he pushed the remains of my bed to the perimeter. Blinky then spread his tentacles so that the entire floor was carpeted with his mucoid flesh, I climbed on top of my dresser to get out of the way. The tip of each tentacle crinkled as if sniffing out a varmint. Arg's nose is better suited for this task, Blinky apologized. On the upside, though, I do have seventy-four of them. This gave me hope until the tentacles ripped away like tape. Blinky backpedaled to the safety of the closet hacking up fizzing troll phlegm that began to eat away at several items of my discarded clothing. The scoundrels are piping up the vilest of odors to throw us off the scent. Strawberries, vanilla, azaleas, coffee. I fear I shall faint like a corseted maiden, or vomit most forcefully, or both in impressive concurrence. We attack, Jack said, right now but we need a different door. Anywhere but here, Blinky moaned. Or regurgitation will be the evening's sport. I know the place, Jack said, but we need to move. There was no argument. Jack strapped on his armor, the metal parts snapping and ringing, harbingers of combat. I kicked aside the clothes sodden with troll puke and chose a shirt and pants that I wouldn't mind dying in. Blinky handed me cat number six and Claire blade, and they felt heavier than ever before. We swept through the living room, and I grabbed the doorknob. It turned, but the door didn't open. All ten locks had been thrown. I began the unlocking regimen before realizing what this meant. I turned around. 
and there was Dad, clutching his battered briefcase, his face patched with stubble, his clothes matted, his unbuttoned left cufflink stained from whatever fast food he'd been living off for the past day. Dad's reaction to seeing an actual troll was so subdued that I worried his brain might politely explode inside his skull. To minimize his size, Blinky folded as many of his appendages behind him as he could. Jack, meanwhile, kneaded the mask in his hand, clearly wishing he could put it on to avoid this encounter. Dad exhaled and inhaled as if both were being done at gunpoint, and reached out to the shelf above the electric fireplace for stability. Various pieces of the Jack Sturgis collection were toppled. Dad gazed at his brother's school photos while he spoke. Jack, he said, why did you come back? I had to, Jack whispered. Then don't leave. Dad's voice broke. Stay here with me. I still have boxes of your clothes. I can buy bikes for the both of us the best they sell. Red for you and yellow for me. I've still got your radio. We can ride and listen to music, Jack. We can shoot our lasers. We can pedal so fast we won't have time to remember any of the bad things that happened. We can grow up together after all. Doesn't that sound like a dream? I can't grow up, Jimbo. Not with you. Not with anyone. Dad slammed his fist onto the shelf. It shook, and the framed milk carton picture fell to the floor, where the glass shattered upon the hearth. Jack jumped, and Blinky gasped. Dad whirled around, his face streaming with tears. I'm lonely up here, Jack! Stay with me! Or take me with you! Jimbo. Wherever you go, I'll go. It's what I should have done years ago. I can't. Take me! I'm ready! You're not. I'm the big brother now, Jack! You have to do what I say! You're too old! Jack's shout rattled the locks upon the door and made the steel shutters hum. We stood there as the cruel echo made its excruciating exit. Dad's taut expression of shock reshaped into folds of grief. He lifted a hand dotted with the first liver spots of old age and touched the jowls that in recent years had elongated his cheeks. The hand continued up past the worry lines carved into his forehead to the scalp that had long before given up its hair. Then I'm overdue, Dad said. Jack's hand clenched his mask. I'm sorry, he mumbled. We hitched up our weapons and turned toward the door. You're taking Jimmy? Dad asked. You're leaving me and taking my son? Dad, I said. I have to go. I forbid it, Dad said, emboldened with the concept. There's danger. Have you seen the news? Danger everywhere! I'll bring him back, Jack said. And if you don't, what then? You'd be tearing apart what's left of this family. When it's in your power to put it all back together! Jack paused with his tack-edged glove on the doorknob. He looked at his boots for a moment, and I could see him measure the truth of what Dad was saying. That night's mission might be one of suicide, and even if that meant a troll invasion and the destruction of the entire continent, one city at a time, perhaps it was still unfair to rob a father and son of those precious last days. This isn't up for debate, I snapped. I'm going. Jim, Jack said. You need to think about what we're about to... I don't have to think. 
That bridge will be finished tomorrow. Kids will die. Kids I know. And we're sitting here discussing it? Look, it's like what Tubb said, except I didn't believe him when he said it. This is what I'm here to do, Dad. This is the only thing I'm good at. There are times when you have to do the right thing, no matter how scary. Both of you should know that more than anyone. If I don't fight now, right now, when am I supposed to fight? Jack was staring at me. It was a look of warning, then of questioning. I did not budge. Slowly, a sad smile crept across his lips. He nodded. Once. We fight, he said. Fight? Blinky laughed. Too humble a word for our despoilings and devastations. Dad collapsed onto the sofa with mannequin stiffness. You're Shakespeare, he monotoned. What about your play? With practiced fingers, I undid all the rest of the locks. Then I saw the keys to the San Bernardino electronics van hanging on a hook beside the door. We were behind schedule, and wheels would sure help us catch up. I took them before I could think better of it. I'm heading over to the field tomorrow to give it a final mowing, Dad continued. Make it all look nice for your play. I ushered Blinky into the night, then Jack, who threw a final regretful look at his brother. I put my hand upon the die-cast vehicles that covered his torso and pushed him down the steps. I took the doorknob and swung the door behind me, pausing for just a moment to watch my dad stare blankly at the dead TV. This could be the last time I saw him. I wanted him to turn around and tell me that he believed that I could do it. I'll come back, Dad, I said. I'll try. I'll try really hard. Yes, of course. He did not look at me. See you tomorrow night at the play. I know you'll be fantastic. Chapter 34 It hurt to leave. But hurting was something every family that had lost a child knew about, and if the troll hunters had one job above all others, it was the ending of that hurt one way or the other before it became something that could never be salved. That night, Jack fulfilled a long-held fantasy. He drove ripping the keys from me and saying that he knew as much about driving as I did, he leapt into the driver's seat while I loaded Blinky into the cargo area that usually held Dad's mower. Once I was strapped into the passenger seat, Jack lurched the van forward, punching a nice neat hole into the garage door. Mistake, he said. My mistake. He reversed through the lawn and kept going until the tires had munched up a flower bed across the street. By this point, though, Jack was having a blast, his eyes sparkling with the kind of intensity I'd only seen in battle. He shoved the gear into drive and stomped on the gas. Once the spinning wheels grabbed hold of the pavement, we accelerated through a cloud of burning rubber, Jack whooping with uncharacteristic glee. He drove the same way he rode his bike back in 1969, headlong, at top speed, and improvising every step of the way. By the time we heaved to a halt in Tubbs' driveway, we'd only dented three cars, demolished one topiary light, and snapped a sapling in half. Jack honked the horn, and Blinky used a tentacle to throw open the side door. The van chugged. Every fiber in my body was in motion. We saw movement at the back of the house. Jack gunned the engine, ready to roll. Arg! Hulked her cautious way along the side of the house, blotting out the yard lights as she approached the van. Once more, it seemed there was no way she'd fit, and yet she did. 
turning the entire back compartment into a stinking lounge of black fur upon which Blinky sat. She seemed to find being inside a human's vehicle almost as novel as Jack did. I adjusted my mirror and noticed something glinting from Arg's mouth. I turned around in my chair. Proudly, she pulled back her furry lips and grinned. Wrapped around each gigantic, lethal tooth was the same chicken wire I'd helped Tub pull through his bedroom window four days before, expertly tightened by metal screws. Braces, Tub said. He stood on the driveway decked out in his best approximation of a ninja. Black tennis shoes, black sweatpants, a black hoodie, a belt made from a red curtain sash, and an oversized fanny pack holding his gear, probably not throwing stars and nunchucks, but who really knew? It was unfortunate that the fanny pack was lime green, but I was still impressed. Tub pointed at his own braces. She liked mine. There was no disguising the satisfaction in his voice. She's actually more aware of her looks than you'd think. So I hooked her up. Not bad, huh? She'll have the best choppers around and just, you know, maybe a couple hundred more treatments. But that's nothing in troll years, right? Arg extended her muzzle from the side door and rested it upon Tub's shoulder. Her blasts of breath wobbled his mountain of frizzed hair. Absently, he patted her on the nose like he'd done it a thousand times, which I realized he probably had. At once I felt terrible and inspired. This friend whom I'd left to deal with this frightening creature had performed so much better than I'd thought possible. Five yellow claws wrapped around Tubbs' considerable gut and lifted him into the back of the van. There was a bruise on Tubbs' jaw from where Steve had thrown him against the locker, but it was nothing. He looked more certain of himself than at any other point in his life. He grinned at me, showing all those glorious braces. You watch my back, I watch yours, he said. It's only fair. He offered up a hand, and I took it. My ninja, I said. My troll hunter, he replied. I don't think Jack was thrilled about having another kid to look out for, but he clenched his teeth and popped the van into gear. The bottom scraped against the driveway with the additional weight. Blinky shut the side door with a tentacle, while another appendage curled around Tub's neck affectionately. I felt a sob catch in my chest. We might all be headed to our deaths, but this right here was a family, no matter how unusual it might be. Off we roared, peeling away strips of lawn and knocking bumpers from cars that, according to Jack, should have been parked closer to the curb. Tub shook off the blows and unfolded from his fanny pack a laminated artifact of Dershowitz lore. The cat list! I cried. You found it! Yeah, well, it wasn't hard to find once all my video games had been eaten. But I'm happy to report that the killing spree is over. Notice there's no cat hair stuck in those fancy new braces? I've converted our friend to cheeseburgers. Pickle, said Arg. Onion. Right, she likes them with pickles and onion. Paper. Is flavor best? Yeah, she likes the wrapping paper left on, too. FYI, you don't want to know how much 200 cheeseburgers cost. My God. Point is, she didn't mean anything by eating all those cats, and she's done with it. Cat no for eat. For chew. I translated, and Tub's face fell. No, no, no. We've been over this. You can't chew them either, okay? Arg gnashed her metal-covered teeth, trying to make sense of it. Tub sighed and snapped the laminated list. I thought a brief eulogy might be in order. He cleared his throat. 
For those brave felines who fell in the fight for freedom, I recite these names so that we will not forget that adorable, undeniable sense of curiosity that got them all eaten. Make this quick, Jack said. We're almost there. And now for the naming of the deceased. Curly Fries. CSI. Mitochlorian. Dow Jones. Tubb shrugged. Grandma watches a lot of TV. He continued. The Wayans brothers. Bridezilla. The Secretary of Agriculture. That's so Raven. The cat formerly known as Prince. Parking now. Jack grunted as if bracing for impact. Parking, parking, hold on. Jack did indeed park, or, as I would have put it, sideswiped a shoulder barrier until both driver's side wheels were punctured. The van jerked to an unhealthy halt, and the engine coughed until it died. I felt bad for Dad, but only for a second. Jack pulled down his mask, planted his hands on the edge of the window, and leapt out. I heard him land on his feet in a pile of dead leaves and hurry away. The other doors were already opening, and so I followed. There was a bank leading down to a dry canal bed, but getting there meant trudging through overgrown weeds. These slowed me down, as did several decades of trash tossed from the street. Only when I had reached the bottom with the others did I realize the significance of the location. It was the Holland Transit Bridge. This ends Disc 7. Here tonight are people that love your presence, God. Here tonight are those that have said, We'd rather have Jesus than anything else.